weekend on Yuga Bear land. All Saints Anglican School would like to acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of this land. We honour and respect the elders, past, present and emerging, and their traditional methods of caring for their country. We also wish to acknowledge those of our Indigenous brothers and sisters who wish to share their knowledge for the sustainable care of their country. History of Suez is about an ambition, an ambition to support major revolutions for human progress. It's the history of hundreds of innovations that help improve mankind's health, protect the environment, and preserve resources essential for life. In 1869, Suez becomes the name of a canal. This was the inauguration of a technological feat that gathered for over 11 years the expertise of the best engineers of the time. By creating the Universal Maritime Suez Canal Company, Ferdinand de Lesseps wanted to fulfill the crazy ambition of the pharaoh's ancient dream to connect east and west by building a 160-kilometer canal between the Red Sea and the Mediterranean. Since the first day of operation, the Suez Canal revolutionized world trade. The Canal de Suez is the beginning of our history. It's the beginning of our industrial adventure and the birth of our name. Suez. But it's much more than this. It's the voluntad de participar en la construcción de un mundo nuevo. De un bienestar compartido por todos que nos motiva a día a día. At the end of the 19th century, with the Industrial Revolution underway, history speeds up and the world begins its urbanization. Water, an essential resource, becomes a public health issue. Imagine, in those days, almost no one had access to running water at home. Side by side with cities, Suez plays a key role in the public hygiene revolution. Engineers innovate in the field of water services. They're able to build water and wastewater infrastructures over great distances. Since 1880, large European cities like Paris, Bordeaux and Barcelona developed their first water and wastewater networks. This revolution in public hygiene results in fewer epidemics, a lower mortality rate and constantly increasing life expectancy. At the beginning of the 20th century, household waste becomes the next public health issue. We've always been pioneers in waste management. In Paris, Suez invents the first ever motorized refuse collection vehicles and introduces a waste collection system using 300 traction vehicles. After World War II, metropolises emerge across Europe, America and Asia, and cities equip and modernize. Vast urban areas have to be managed sustainably and suburban growth must be supported. It's no longer enough to supply water to the city. Now it's also a question of ensuring a constant level of quality, meeting the massive rise in consumption whilst avoiding wasting water and treating urban wastewater and industrial effluents. Urban growth also forces a change in waste management. Suez innovates by creating facilities capable of managing waste on a large scale. Challenges faced by countries in the north are now becoming issues for the south. Suezhi Nengyuan Jituan Budan Chongxin, we Shijie Gadi Renman Tikong Yin Yong Shui, Chu Shui Di Chu de Jumin, Ye Bao Ku Zai Ne. At the end of the 1990s, Suez became a world reference in environmental services in Europe, the USA, South America, China, Africa, the Middle East, and shortly afterwards in Australia. On the 12th of December 2015, at the end of the COP21, the first Universal Climate Agreement was signed unanimously by 195 states and the European Union. Citizens everywhere take action for the climate and the environment and call on all players to step up their contribution. 150 years after the inauguration of the Suez Canal, a winning spirit continues to motivate all the group's employees. Suez is announcing a new ambition 
to shape a sustainable environment now with cities, industries and citizens. Sustainable solutions enable our customers to have a positive impact on climate and on the planet's natural capital. Parce que l'innovation change le monde, nous imaginons des modèles zéro déchet. We develop cutting edge technology solutions to optimize water use. Dépolluer les sols, améliorer la qualité de l'air et rendre les villes intelligentes. Our solutions will enable our customers to avoid yearly 20 million tons of carbon emissions by 2030. 100% des solutions que nous proposerons aux villes et aux industriels d'ici 2030 seront durables. Motivated by a passion for the environment, the 90,000 Suez employees are committed to inventing disruptive solutions to preserve and restore the fundamental elements of the environment, water, air and soil, and to shaping a sustainable environment together, now. Suez, the winning spirit. Hello, welcome to the 2020 Sustainability Symposium. My name is Erin Merring and I am the chairperson of the Sustainable Schools Network. Firstly, I'd like to address the current situation that everyone finds themselves in with COVID-19. It is currently difficult for many people in Australia and throughout the world. And I just want you to know that the Sustainable Schools Network want to ensure the safety of our community, but we also want to ensure the connectedness of our community at this time. And that is why we are hosting the 2020 Sustainability Symposium fully supported online. Okay, before I get into it as well, I wanted to make a mention of our sponsors partners, supporters, and volunteers. Without you, this would not be possible, so thank you. I particularly would like to mention the Suez Group for their grant, the Gold Coast City Council Water and Waste Directorate for your sponsorship two years running now, so thank you. Some of our new sponsors that have come on board, Envirotech Education, Study Gold Coast, the All Saints P and F, thank you for your support of this event. Again, a number of councillors have also pledged support for the 2020 Sustainability Symposium, and they include Councillor Daphne McDonald, Councillor Gail O'Neill, and Councillor Pauline Young. Thank you for your support. And finally, to our founding partners, Glowing Green Australia, Green Culture and Farm, Eco Avengers, Natura Education, and the Australian Association for Environmental Education, Queensland Chapter. Thank you for your support. Finally, one last mention is Camps International, our program sponsor for 2020. Thank you. Okay, today I remain incredibly proud of the work of the Sustainable Schools Network and their achievements over the past 12 months. The goal of educating, connecting and imagining a sustainable future is imperative for all. When my students in my classroom engage with the concept of sustainability, I often reflect and think, it is simply about being a better custodian of the planet. It is about care, it is about compassion, it is about better ethics. Why, if we couldn't, wouldn't we teach more sustainably, be more sustainable in the future? If it can be done, why not do it? I said last year in my symposium speech that sustainability isn't an end destination. It is a journey. Many of you are coming on this journey with the Sustainable Schools Network and we couldn't be more excited. I remain committed to the Sustainable Schools Network and think now more than ever that we must remain committed to the Sustainable Development Goals. It is my pleasure today to introduce two of our speakers for our event. Firstly, Luca Lesson will be presenting a session to students on poetry for social justice. And Luca has had much experience in this area where he has developed and designed educational based programs for social change. I feel that this session will be extremely worthwhile, particularly for students, and I look forward to seeing what he has to offer. The second person I would like to introduce today is Rory O'Connor from the Yugen Bear Museum. Rory will be engaging the audience on indigenous concepts surrounding totem poles and how we can protect flora and fauna in our local area. I again look forward to engaging with this presentation as well and hope that many of the students that attend the online symposium really get a lot from both of these presentations. As I said, I remain committed to the 2020 Sustainability Symposium to build better relationships and remain connected during this time. 
We all need to come together for a common purpose and building relationships and staying connected right now is valuable and vital. I encourage you all to engage with the materials and the online events taking place, particularly the Connect Ed Feed dinner where we will be having a panel on education for sustainability and people like Damon Gamo from 2040, Jamie Cloud from the Cloud Institute for Sustainability are just among some of the fantastic presenters and speakers we will have at that event. I look forward to engaging with you all online and to continuing to build a future that is sustainable, resilient for our students and our children. Please enjoy what we have to offer. Thank you. Time won't stop, so gonna get on the ride. Twisting and turning through life. No matter how rough it gets, I'll get by. Every day will always bring me something new My pleasure to introduce Rory O'Connor. Rory O'Connor is a descendant of Jackie Jackie, King of Logan Pimpama, and also Jenny Graham, a prominent Aboriginal woman in the Southeast Queensland region. As CEO of the Yugan Bear Museum in Beenleigh, Rory is the driving force behind many positive initiatives keeping Yugan Bear Aboriginal heritage alive in the Southeast region. As the tribe's scribe, he has spent much time with the elders past and present and has produced numerous books, exhibitions and videos to help preserve their stories and memories. Rory is the founder of the annual three-day Aboriginal walking pilgrimage, the Drumley Walk, which follows in the footsteps of Aboriginal leader Billy Drumley. Today, Rory invites students to learn about and engage with the Indigenous concept of totems. I welcome Rory and hope you enjoy the presentation. I'm Rory O'Connor, I'm CEO of the Yugan Bear Museum Language and Heritage Research Centre. I'd like to talk to you about Aboriginal totems. Aboriginal totems are a way of protecting people, animals, plants and parts of the landscape that have been developed over tens of thousands of years and hundreds of generations by Aboriginal communities. Totems are something that Aboriginal people have and non-Aboriginal people in Australia don't have, but this is a, a little way I'm going to explain them to you. Maybe find a way that you too could share some of the benefits that come with, with having totems and being connected to community. Put together a, an exhibition at the museum and I'll share some of that with you. Um, and for this, we spoke to people in community about what, what totems mean to them, what did it mean traditionally and, and how they can link with totems in their daily life in the modern world. And I think uh, Auntie says it very well when she says, totems protect everything by protecting one thing. Totems protect everything by protecting just one thing. And that's Auntie Mary Graham, who's an elder. So what does it actually mean in practical terms when we talk about a person having a totem? Well. In practical terms, a totem can be given to you at birth. You might have one or multiple totems given to you. Often they're animals. Your family may also have another totem. Your clan may have a totem. You might have a totem because you're a male or a female within your family group. So a person may have multiple totems and they're all equally as important. Now the bunin, the echidna here we can see, as we know, they were great to eat. But if that was your totem, you wouldn't eat it, which meant there was one less family eating bunning. And more than that, it was spiritually linked to you. So you'd be looking out for bunning whenever you were in the bush, whenever you're around, and you'd be making sure that the conditions were right for it to stay protected and healthy. So you'd be making sure the foods that it 
bits were there. If there were dingoes or humans were eating too many of them, you'd be protecting against that. You might even go to the other families and say, hey, there's not a lot of bullying around this summer. Don't eat them, please. Just, just back off them. Out of respect, they would not eat them because they would know, oh, that family is connected to the bullying and they wouldn't harm the animal in front of myself if it was my totem. And this was a way of ensuring that every animal, every plant and places had a human protector to look after it. And it's even with places. So uh, Auntie Glenda is a lady I interviewed not long ago and she was explaining that her totems included a whirly whirly by a bend in a river. And when you think of it, she said, well, the wind would protect us. It would go away when we wanted to fish. And when people came to take fish in a way that wasn't right, the wind would come up and protect it. And her role was to make sure that the trees stayed around the river that helped that wind. And also the river was clean and she had a responsibility to look after that. Now, we'd like to encourage you not to have a traditional Aboriginal totem, but maybe to have some of the learnings that came with totems. And we've chosen animals within our space and some birds. And we'd like you to look at those and see how you can incorporate these learnings into your daily life. You'll see we've got Babangan there and on the panel for a dolphin, people call dolphin the Gawanda as well. But we'd like you to look around your place, where you are, and look at what animals, what landscapes, what things could really do with a protection. So Regan is a Gungri woman from Mitchell Way. And she said, you know, hers is a carpet snake. And it makes her feel strong when she goes on to country because she keeps a lookout for the carpet snake and she feels connected to that. And it gives her a purpose. And it also gives her a connection to her older people, her elders, because they know that someone is carrying on that tradition to look after that. And she doesn't always live on country, but when she does, it's something very important to her. I was at an event with Brad Curry, a Mananjali man, and he shared that their totem is the wedgetail eagle. And he said it's a very important totem for his community. And incidentally, as we were there, and it was a very important event, he said, look up. And sure enough, we looked up, and there above us, we saw three mibbon, uh, the wedgetail eagles, circling above us. So these have very real connections in our life. And some of these stories are gathered in this exhibition that we did at the museum. And you can buy these panels to put up at your school or in your workplace just to give you closer access to some of the stories that community members share about totems and what they mean to, to people uh, in, in today's day and age and what sorts of things we can do as individuals to help. So what we've got here is a, a totem investigation uh, exercise and we'd like you to look at some of the traditional totems of our area, uh, maybe start a project book where you can gather information and find out about them. And remember, different totems have different characteristics. I was speaking to one lady and her husband's totem was a jingri jingri, a woolly wagtail. And I said, oh, what was that about? She said, oh, natural performers, they're showmen, they're singing and dancing and they're carrying on and they're the messenger bird. They, they come and they give you a message. So there's a very important animal, but when you understand a bit more about its personality, you also learn how you can protect it and what you can learn from that animal that other people might know but you'll know it, and after generations and generations of your family line having that animal as a totem, how much knowledge would you have in your family about that particular animal? And these are some of the strengths of these traditional ways of thought which can carry through into our life today. And it's very important that we, we think, how can we help the community we're in? And I'll leave you with this. If everyone living in Yugan Bear Country, Logan, Gold Coast, Scenic Rim, not just Aboriginal people, but non-Aboriginal people, looked at the spiritual connection that totems gave to humans and the, the protection that the animals and the plants and the places got from it, wouldn't we have a more sustainable community today? Nanyabu.
it is my pleasure to introduce Luca Lesson. Luca Lesson is a poet and rapper whose work engages with the Greek mythology of his family homeland, the fiercely political and the vulnerably self-reflective. Luca has performed with the Queensland Symphony Orchestra, released his own musical albums and books and been published in a number of international poetry collections. Luca has toured with poets such as Shane Koizan and Omar Musa, with musicians such as Akala and Nako, and with thinkers such as Dr Cornel West and Shitez Cot Martinez. Luca Lesson has always used education-based programs as a means for social change, both within Australia and abroad, and his work is currently being studied in English departments across the country. Luca also runs his own annual poetry-based writer's retreat in his grandfather's village on the island of Rhodes in Greece. Academically, Luca holds a Master's of Sound Design in Performance Poetry and Anthropology undergraduate degree and a First Class Honours in Indigenous Studies. Luca's latest solo work entitled Agapi and Other Kinds of Love will premiere in Melbourne in 2020. I now introduce and hope you engage with the presentation by Luca Lesson. Hello and greetings to everyone at the Sustainability Symposium 2020. I hope you're all feeling safe and well out there and focused on the tasks we have at hand to build a more sustainable future out of the rubble that we find ourselves in. Uh, my name is Luca and this is a long distance workshop that I'm sending to you all from uh, my isolation chambers here and I would uh, like to ask you all a question to begin with and it's important to understand the answer to this question and that is how can we be of assistance to rebuilding a better future than the one that we've been engaged with up until now and in reimagining that future we can write, create, build and decide what it is that comes next. So that's one question I want you to mill over while I'm talking through the directions of this process or the basics of this process moving forward. Because it's a long distance workshop and I've given this workshop hundreds of times around the planet over the past few years, it's not going to be as long as it would be if I was there in person. That's mainly because we have the ability, you have the ability to pause me, to stop me and to write for as long as you want every time I give you a prompt. So this process is usually me walking around the class waiting for you all to do your writing in between each prompt and idea that I give you. And I wait for as long as it takes until I feel as though each uh, prompt has been fulfilled. So the class or the room has pretty much 99% of the people have completed each prompt, have written something uh, in each moment. Sometimes that's two minutes, sometimes that's 10 minutes. So it's up to you and you can pause anytime you want after I've given an instruction and I'll leave maybe 30 seconds silence between each instruction for you to be able to do that before pressing go on me again. So this is a workshop based around social change or social issues. And right now we find ourselves in a situation where social issues are some of the most important things that we need to think, rethink, redesign and build together. All the social issues that existed before our current situation still exist and some of them will be exacerbated by this current situation as well. So we need you. We need your voices now more than ever. And it seems like there's such a bombardment of content and things going up online these days that it's your authenticity, your honesty, your vulnerability, your passion that will cut through the sales pitches and the media frenzy that we see at the moment. So it's important for you, for us as writers, as poets, and I regard you all as writers and poets right now, to not be vague, to be honest and direct and impassioned and powerful with our words. 
and not to run away from the scary things that we're too frightened to write about. So I want you to write about something that you know about, a social issue that you've thought about before, a prejudice that you may have experienced before, something that you yourself are passionate about. It's not really time for us to be fearful or scared of what our classmates or teachers or um, fellow friends or family members or colleagues at work might judge us for. It's time for us to say our truth respectfully, clearly, without shutting down someone else's truth, but without fear of being judged or being silenced. And usually I try and give people an idea of what it is that they should write about. And that's much easier for me to do when I'm in the room. But it's very important that now you pause my video and you spend some time brainstorming what it is that you are going to write about, having conversations about what it is that you want to discuss in terms of the social issues that you have uh, in the forefront of your mind or around you. Maybe you can't think of anything right now and you need to take some time to do that. Um, whatever it is, you take a moment to brainstorm, to think, maybe discuss with the people in and around you if you're, um, you've got companions in your isolation. But it's really important to remember to speak on all the issues or to think about all the issues that were going on before and after this current crisis. And that will be going on for possibly a very long time or perhaps be exacerbated by this crisis. Things like poverty or homelessness or health. Um, and try and be as specific as possible. So homelessness as a broad general thing to write about is not enough. Research homelessness right now in your community. What's happening to the shelters, maybe women's shelters that are running from domestic violence after being in isolation with their partners. Um, sexism is not enough as a subject. Think about sexism in a specific workplace or a specific industry in Australia or another specific country or city. Cases of cyberbullying towards young women in Australian Catholic schools, for instance, or um, racism, again, as a broad general thing is not enough. Think about specific structures that support and hold up racism. Uh, or racism that you've experienced or seen with your own eyes, an anecdote, a story, something you witnessed on a bus. These can be the really powerful starting points for our writing. So as I said before, I suggest you pause now and spend some time doing some research. So you should have thought about your topic and maybe had a look somewhere online or had a brainstorm or written down some basic ideas. Um, could just be a list of words that surround certain topics. Once you've done that, I want you to actually go out and online find six facts or statistics around your topic. So I want you to delve deep into the research, go really hard. I want you to cut and paste and steal all the stats and facts that you can find, um, keeping all the references that you can find from your online sources, uh, but taking as many specific stats and facts that you can. If they are long sentences of facts, cut and paste those long sentences, but don't use them in the poem um, exactly as they are but cut and paste them and put them into a new file somewhere, maybe a Google Doc. And make sure you have at least six stats or facts around your specific topic. Again, not just homelessness worldwide, but specifically in your town or your community or a specific aspect. Maybe there's an intersection of two different issues, sexism and homelessness or racism and homelessness. Um, for those of you who don't know about this discussion of intersectionality, that's where all of us find ourselves in an intersection of different forms of oppression or privilege. So I myself am Greek Australian, so I have experienced racism, but I'm straight male and so I also experience certain types of privilege. 
I live in a country area where we don't get as many um, services here outside of Byron Bay. Um, but I am privileged in that I can experience nature and I can experience some things that people living in a, a slum in a city in a in a place like Brazil and or places like New York can't experience. So we all have these kind of intersections. Um, I've had mental health conversations and issues in my life. So that's another kind of form of maybe an issue that I could say is oppressive in my life. So we all have these intersections. And so maybe there's an intersectionality aspect to what you're, you're studying, to homelessness. Um, I know that in the US, for instance, um, women of African-American heritage are more likely to die at childbirth than women who aren't. So these types of things might be uh, a deeper way to go. Either way, pause again now to go deep with your research and get six facts or stats. So once you've done that research, the next level is to move forward with some writing. Um, now that you've got your topic pretty solid, the point of writing that I wish to start from is a stream of consciousness exercise. A stream of consciousness exercise is literally you just writing nonstop from start to finish anything and everything that comes to your mind um, around this topic. So it can be a list of words, it can be uh, sentences, paragraphs, their spelling doesn't matter, subject matter doesn't really matter as long as you're spilling out words to do with your topic somehow. Um, if you can't think of anything I want you to write, I can't think of anything, I can't think of anything. Um, this is literally just the process of getting your hand moving with your pen in your hand or your hands moving on the typewriter, whatever works for you on the laptop. Um, the point is to shut down the critical side of the brain and give some freedom to the creative side of the brain. So I literally, if you can't think of anything, I literally want you to write, I can't think of anything a hundred times. And if that's all you write, that is still a win. Much more of a win than being frozen and staring at the ceiling and freaking out that nothing's pouring out. The point is to get the pen or the words pouring out. It doesn't matter what they are just yet. And I want you to do that for six minutes. So put a little timer on and time yourself for six minutes doing free writing. Even if this topic doesn't come up that much, the topic that you want to write about, as long as you're writing something and there is a stream of words flowing, that is the most important thing. So that's six minutes. So you can pause me now and do that six minutes. All right, so we're going to do this again, but this time six minutes of free writing, but only in questions. So I want you to write six minutes worth of rhetorical questions on your page. So that means writing anything and everything you can think of around your topic, around your issue. How does it start? When did it begin? When does it form? How do we stop it? Why does it occur? All these questions. Every single line that you write for the next six minutes should end with a question mark. Don't need to answer them, just need to ask them. So six minutes, stream of consciousness, rhetorical questions, starting now. Okay, so now that you've done those two exercises and gotten yourself some research, it is now time to delve into the poem itself. So you've basically created all these ingredients, you've got the stream of consciousness, you've got your creative, creative juices flowing, you've delved into the subject. This could have been, you know, a 20 minute process, or it could have been maybe a two hour process, depends how deeply you want to go into the subject, up to you. And that's the beauty, I guess, of doing this from a distance. Your workshop can actually be as long as you want it to be. Um, and next time you do it, if you do this on another topic, you can expand and contract the exercises as well but this is the poem itself so the next part of the poem uh, the first part of the poem sorry that we will lead into the entire writing process of this poem with is a line 
that I just want you to finish the back end of. So I'm going to start it for you and you just have to finish it. So the very first line of your poem, I just wanted to start with the words, no one ever told me. So just start your line with no one ever told me. And then from there, finish it off with anything you like. If you're writing about homelessness, I don't want you to write, no one ever told me about homelessness. <laughs> that is not pretty and it's not powerful and it's not um, symbolic or metaphoric. It doesn't really capture people's attention. It sounds like an essay. We're not writing an essay, even where, though we're using stats and facts, what we're going to do is combine those stats and facts with poetic language. So the first line of your poem is something that needs to be a little bit more poetic than just one or two words. Try and find an image. Instead of saying, no one ever told me about homelessness, maybe you could say, no one ever told me how cold concrete gets at 2 a.m. while you're lying on it, asleep. Um, an image, something that you can see. If you're thinking about writing about maybe school shootings, you could say, no one ever told me how quickly a bullet can pierce a backpack. These are the types of images we're looking for. So that's line one, and you can pause me here before we get to line two if you like. Okay, so line two, I just wanted to start with the words, they say. Line two, start with the words, they say. First line was, no one ever told me. Second line starts with, they say. And you can pause me here before the next line. Third line, start with the words, I say. So you're responding to what they say with your I say, you are imposing yourself upon the poem uh, in a more direct and didactic way. What is your opinion at the moment on this topic or on what they say about this topic? That's line three. Line four would be to insert a fact or a stat. So this is the first time you're going to get your get to use your research. So pull up the facts or stats that you looked at before that you pulled from your research and see if you can insert one in a creative way in this next line. It could be as simple as, did you know that 45% of whatever's do whatever? Um, it, very simple. doesn't have to be extremely poetic. This is the opportunity to put the facts, um, the knowledge, and the research into your poem and interweave it between the creative or more poetic lines. So line four, fact or stat. Now, line five. Line five starts with the words, all I know is, all I know is. Line one was no one ever told me. Line two, they say. Line three, I say. Line four, a fact or stat. And line five, all I know is. Just finish that line. Line six, I want you to go back into your writing, back into the stream of consciousness, and I want you to pull out one of your rhetorical questions that you pulled out for line six. So I want you to use one of those questions and place it here. And then for line seven, I want you to answer that question. So that is line six and line seven. This can be as creative and, ab and abstract and powerful and long and short as you wish. Um, it's up to you. But this is line six and seven. One of your questions from earlier. 
coupled with an answer to that question. So line eight, we go back to, back to the facts and the stats. So you have had three lines and then fact and stat, and then three more lines and then another fact and a stat or stat. So that's line eight. So after you've answered your own rhetorical question, which is no longer rhetorical, you insert a fact or a stat in there. So for line nine, line nine, I would like you to start the line with the words, the truth is. So start the line with the words, the truth is. Try not to answer it with a fact or a stat. Just use the words, the truth is. Remember, this is not an essay. This is not an assignment. This is not a report on homelessness or social issues. This is a poem. Be creative. Be abstract. Use an image. Instead of saying the truth is 62% of people don't enjoy blah, blah, blah. You could say the truth is I walk past a homeless man every day on the way to school and I never said hello to him once. Yeah. Self-reflect. Pull out your own examples. Question yourself. Don't have to paint yourself and probably shouldn't paint yourself as a savior in all of this. We have enough of those, but we have to question ourselves. Maybe this is an opportunity to have a look at yourself um, through this line. The truth is, I haven't done enough yet. Uh, the truth is, I don't know the answers. Number nine, line nine, starts with, the truth is. Line 10 is using, again, a fact or a stat. This is your last chance to use a fact or a stat. We only have 12 lines altogether in this particular poem process. So this is your last chance to use a fact or a statistic. So you might want to go through the six different facts or stats that you pulled up and, and choose out of the ones you haven't used yet, uh, the best one. Yeah, that you might have been saving or that you think has the biggest impact or is the most powerful. So that's line 10, another fact or statistic. And for line 11, some people love me and some people hate me for this. Line 11 is a free line. It is completely up to you what you want to write. There is no structure that I'm giving you. Some people completely hate that because they like the structure. Some people love it because they like to be given some space to breathe, some freedom. So it's up to you. If you're stuck, the best way to move forward with it is to read through what you've written so far in the poem from lines 1 to 10. And then usually line 11 will just come to you. It'll, it'll appear. You'll know what you feel like needs to happen next. It is the second last line though. So I'm gonna give you the last line as well so you know where you're headed. And that is that the last line, I just want you to use repetition in some way. This is often how I will end off a process of writing a poem uh, within a workshop context. So find another line that you like from your poem that you've written already and either repeat it exactly as a carbon copy for the last line or remix it in some way. For instance, you could have said, no one ever told me what the concrete feels, how cold the concrete is at 2 a.m. while I was trying to sleep. And you could use it exactly the same for your last line, or you could say something like, no one ever told me how the concrete feels uh, in the middle of the day, how hot it is um, during the day. So that could be a, w a way to remix that first line, but still use repetition in some way. Totally up to you. But line 11, free line, Line 12, repetition. You could just repeat line 11 twice. Up to you. So that's 12 lines. Line 11, free line, line 12, repetition. You can pause me here.
but I'll still have a little chat after you finish your last line. So, you should have finished an entire poem so far. Most of you will probably think this is a terrible poem. That is totally fine. It's not a problem. The secret of writing is to keep writing, to keep turning up, to keep creating, and to acknowledge that some things don't work out, but some things do. And if you've written a 12-line poem here and you only like two or three lines, that's actually a really good average. That's a good percentage in terms of most writers and most poets. Uh, we don't keep everything we write, and we surely don't keep every single line that we've written of a, of a poem from start to finish and call it a final draft or a final copy. Uh, often this takes a lot of more delving into, a lot more work, but you should have the beginning of something. You should have something that feels rounded, something that feels like it comes full circle with the repetition at the end, and that says something about the topic that you chose that is a powerful enough thing to start to change minds, to start to get people thinking, to start asking questions, to start um, provoking answers and provoking conversations. And that's really what we need in today's world. So that's my very simple social issues process um, when it comes to writing poems. The stream of consciousness exercises could be two hour exercises. You could write for hours, just stream of consciousness. You could write for hours, just questions. Um, it's incredible how deep we really can go if we put our minds to it and strap ourselves to the chair and turn off uh, any distractions. And the poem itself, instead of being 12 lines, it could be 24 lines and you can make up your own prompts in between mine to, to fatten it out, to fill it out a bit more, um, to see what else is hiding in there in your subconscious or in your poet's mind. Again, please understand your own position and your own intersectionality in all of this. Um, there are many saviors out in the world and we don't need to be saviors, but we do need to ask many more questions of the planet and ask what it is that we are doing in our small circles to promote sustainability, not just environmental sustainability, but also sustainability for health, emotional stability, sustainability, and that the sustainability of being stable in our minds and in our emotions, um, the ability for us to be sustainable in our relationships and connections to each other, and as poets and artists and what we put out into the world um, is what we're doing sustainable on all levels. It's a question I always keep asking myself and there's always more answers the deeper you look. And that's the most important thing. Not thinking that we have all the answers, but understand that we just have to keep asking more questions of ourselves. Much love everybody. I hope you're all very well out there and finding your inner peace amongst the madness. Um, let this be an opportunity for us to press reset on the planet. Much love. Thank you.